we did this uh, on Instagram. It was the last show that I did live on Instagram, and people loved it. They went crazy when you came on and took over. You're hilarious. <laughs> I'm just saying, man. You just like uh -huh. totally came over and took over. Uh, what is there about you um, that you could pinpoint that makes you this high caliber guest for podcasts? Is it That's your humility? Very good question, <laughs> Preston. Uh, that might be the hardest question uh, you've ever asked me. It took me four days. Humility. That's a good one. <laughs> Definitely. I have eaten some humble pie <laughs> plenty of times. And yeah. I love pie. You love but pie. It's probably that and just being real, keeping it real, real, son. Yes, you keep it real in the neighborhood. And uh, that's why a number of people ask me, they said on Instagram, uh, where we where our home was initially, and we will still go back there. But now we're here on YouTube. A number of people ask me on Instagram, when are you going to bring her back? She was funny. She, I really enjoyed it. And I learned so much. And then I said, who are you talking about? <laughs> funny than funny looking so. uh, but oh, you man. you sent me a couple of things that you wanted to talk about and i instead of doing it on instagram i said well hey let's just do it uh as a part of our closing days here on our second season here on youtube so um let's get right to it uh because you know low budget show we're not really spectacular on a lot of stuff low budget high quality <laughs> that's right high quality in the neighborhood that's right we're like a liquor store in the ghetto uh so anyhow here we, here we go ready i can read um that's good so on one side you got the narcissist has a neurotic need to take and exploit others to keep feeding the false sense of self right mm -hmm. and then on the other side codependent that'd be me that was, Ooh. um has a neurotic also neurotic need to give and self-sacrifice to gain approval and affection mm. i know uh -oh. that very well Oh, really? How, 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 before we go any further, for yeah. those who have never met you before, how is it possible that you know about this? Well, I have been reading and learning a lot. Thank God. So all of like what we're doing right now, I've watched and read and learned so much. So I have a big thank you to everybody who's been spreading the word and the education, the awareness all of these yeah. years about this, because without it, I wouldn't be here today. And without really? you just talking about this openly so thank god oh man so reading and being willing to be aware and kind of acknowledge when mm -hmm. you feel pain throughout life i think it's just acknowledging okay why am i feeling this pain what's going on and just starting to break everything down and i got to that point where it became so painful emotionally like inside of myself i started learning about this and going oh my god that's what i'm doing and the light bulbs were going off it's like epiphanies right has has that been kind of the pattern that you were experiencing for quite a while or yeah. only in that particular relationship? No, like as long as I can remember. So wow. it's been really eye opening for me to go all the way back when I, my memory started at five or six years old and that people pleasing dynamic started within my family and just with my parents and the people pleasing and my parents were old school. So it's like, you know, I was raised very Christian and very like with that, like behavior, you know, you got to, behave and you're going to people please to your parents and to everybody else and they're going to whip you in line quite literally sometimes <laughs> you, you so you you pretty much didn't recognize what you were experiencing till you got older or in other words while you were in a relationship yeah i don't think i i started learning a little bit about this when i was in my early 20s to mid to late 20s and i got married very young i settled down very young um, and I think I separated when I was like 28, I think we divorced when I was 30. So I did all of that real early and I, it took me many years to kind of take one step at a time. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, over the past like five to seven years, I started acknowledging more and then diving deep into a real narcissistic relationship the last two years just uh -huh. did it in for me to go, Oh Lord. Oh Lordy. Uh, you went through your codependent experience oh my life yeah my whole life all your life what words of advice do you give to codependents who may not know their codependents 
I think it's better to learn and acknowledge it earlier on and be real with yourself because you're only hurting yourself in the long run without being true to yourself. Just don't lie to yourself. Educate yourself. Read about it. Learn about it. Even if you think, oh, that's that's not me. That ain't me. (laughs) You know, go ahead. Pick it up. Just read about it. I've actually been able to, because I am being real about it, I've been able to talk to some people I know and some friends and some acquaintances. Yeah. And even help them because I'm putting myself like, oh, I don't know everything, but here's my experience. And some people, oh my God, I think I'm codependent. <gasps> I didn't know that. And they're they're getting older and they didn't find this out until their 40s, 50s, 60s. A couple of them I was talking to. I have all different kinds of friends, right? Right, right. And all ages, all backgrounds. Yeah. And so I was so happy to hear a few of them admit that as I was sharing about this. Because uh, I knew a few of them were like in the back of my head. But I'm like, I'll never say that. But hopefully maybe they'll learn because let's be honest, when you get to a certain age groups, like this information wasn't available, like the Internet was not available. Some, you know what I mean? And now we're on here learning about all this. It just wasn't um, around. Now you trauma have- response. Sometimes yeah. It's like it's part of my personality, but it's also like a trauma response as well to keep everybody smiling and laughing. But it is part of me. So it's kind of hard to see where that line goes. Like, where does that line blur? And he's the same way. Sometimes well, I'll just reel him in. I'll be like, hey, it's all right. Like, we don't have to be laughing all the time. Yeah. You know? And sometimes right. we sit there and cry and hold each other and just hmm. and then smile and laugh later. <laughs> and, you, and you have such great pictures on your Instagram page uh, of you and him together, uh, even your latest postings. Uh, tell everyone your Instagram page, even though it is scrolling across the bottom of the screen. At... Crystal Nicole Black. That is my birth given real name. Your birth given. Yeah, not not your uh your witness protection name uh no. that you use. No. Um, I was born a small white child in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> December twenty seventh. I have the same experience. <laughs> so I was born. Okay. So anyhow, now uh taker giver dynamic. Uh you've experienced that. Uh your yeah. advice. Uh, when it comes to the blame shifter acceptor dynamic, uh, why don't you read uh, that uh, for us? Yeah, so that one on the narcissist side, it says that they think they're infallible, therefore, it's always someone else's fault every time. Don't ever forget it. Because sometimes I would think, well, sometimes it's, you know, it can't be like that every time. No, every time. Every time. Even when it doesn't make any sense, well, even if you have proof. Or evidence of anything, it really doesn't matter. It's your fault. No. You, so so you're telling me you took you took the blame for certain things that were not your fault and uh you convinced yourself that it was? A lot of the time, yeah. Especially when on the other side you're reading, oh, the codependent takes the blame, they're self critical, they think they're bad a lot of the time inherently, right? That I'm I must be the one that's wrong because you're too good of a person almost sometimes in a, in a way thinking, well, I must be the one that's wrong because there's no reason or why would they do this to me or be saying this or right. it doesn't make sense. And it's like, no, some people are really pathologically uh, just not right. Did and you- when you're dealing with a pathological issue, like yeah logical liar narcissist then Mm -hmm. you're done like of course it's not gonna make sense but i did grow up with that black and white thinking which is what the narcissist has very black and white very Mm -hmm. right or wrong but they're just always the one that's right yeah it's all in the actions right all it's all in the behavior because as i've learned as we've all learned it's it's not in what is said because they can Talk in circles, whether they're a narcissist or whether they're simply just a more toxic, manipulative person. So from one end of the spectrum to the middle to the other, it's this whole thing, right? But Mm -hmm. it's not what they say, because of course they're going to bend their words and twist everything around of what you're saying and throw it back and gaslight and deny and blame and shift and lie and all of those things, Mm because they're just in it for them. They're unable, unfortunately, blocked meant to wear your shoes and sit in your seat and care unfortunately so so when you when you were experiencing that in a relationship do you feel that you stopped becoming a a giver and you've lost your empathy because of dealing with someone like that 
So I was reading about that because a lot of people were like, oh, how am I ever going to fall in love again or be in a relationship at all or date anyone? I'm not going to be able to do any of these things. Even with their friends, it's, they're like, oh, I'm being paranoid. And I think I went through that in a very short amount of time. It was very post-traumatic symptoms, like really bad ones, like really bad memory glitches, like totally blanking out on tons of stuff, lots of brain fog, short-term memory loss, working memory problems. It was such a flurry for a short amount of time Mm -hmm. that I think I went through all the hard stuff in that short amount of time. And then I was able to kind of bounce out of it and start making action steps coming out and and finding myself again and going, oh, I'm still here. Oh, thank God. Like I didn't lose myself because it's scary. When you started bouncing out of that, for someone who is just now starting to Google narcissism, toxic uh, relationships, and so forth, uh, describe for someone just beginning their journey, when you say you bounced out of that, (laughs) what did that taste like, smell like, seem like? What was that that like? What did you do? What were some of the things (laughs) that you did that you knew that you were on on the bounce back? Yeah, for what was good faces, like Man, oh, okay i was gonna save that for last i was gonna save it but you brought it <laughs> making faces Those are just a couple of faces did that help you making faces was that your thing oh i think i've always done that and my son i look at him he looks like a male version of me i swear to god like he he makes faces like, i've seen your faces yes. yeah you, i don't even care all of them yeah. no He's you're some face making family man i tell you guys make faces <laughs> It's like, so what was the bounce back like? What are some of the things that started happening that you knew that you still had you intact? At least you found yourself again. I was like, thank God. Like, it is scary when you don't recognize yourself. Like, from physically, I looked in the mirror and didn't write to my head, the way my brain was working and feeling and my emotions. my Everything was mm-hmm. feeling foreign and scary and bad. And then it freaks you out more, right? You're like, ah, so I took a lot of time to myself. I did isolate myself a little bit because I was having Mm -hmm. trouble showing up everywhere. Like I was still working through this and I literally had to like tell my boss at the time and reach out and be like, Hey, I need to work from home. So I need to do this because literally like I am going through. And she kind of probably had a little taste because I had told her a couple Ooh. things without getting too oh, personal. You told her a few things. Okay. Not personal, but just kind of like, it's, I had to even use, use the word PTSD. Like I had to use that term because I don't think she understood, you know. What you were going the, through. Yeah. Like the intensity of it. Okay. And I can do my job. Like I can do it. It's just the way I was showing up. I looked so bad. Like I didn't look like me. Like. I'm not saying Mm -hmm. I always look good, but you know what I mean? Like, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Like, not like this. Like, I look more like myself right now. You didn't Um, recognize mm -hmm. who you were while you were going through it or getting away from it. But you recognize who you are now. Yeah. Even though I can feel the residual, like, I'm not quite the same. And I'm not afraid to admit that. And I openly share, I am not quite the same. I have some nervousness to me. I have more hyperactivity. I have some more yeah. symptoms that are coming out even more so hmm. after then, but it's not as bad as like, yeah, going through the, the thick of it. Right. Um, so my so health is getting better because I'm eating better and I'm doing all, you know, all of those okay. exercising. <laughs> That's actually the next thing I was about to, to ask you about Yeah. the, the health part, the physical part, mm-hmm. how you feel physically. Uh, yeah. was affected by being in this type of a relationship yeah. uh, with a taker, uh, with a person who who is not empathetic. Uh, a narcissistic, toxic relationship had a profound effect on you physically and just your desire to do things physically is what you're saying. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I'll be honest with the whole time. I love it when people say, I'll be honest. I'm like, <laughs> the whole time you're lying and then yeah. you're honest. It's just fun to say <laughs> for me. <laughs> Uh, uh you're funny okay go ahead. Like, go ahead speak your truth girl go on preach it speak. oh i nothing but the truth i got tr- truth right. there i'm just dripping out my arm right here give me the put that needle down okay all right go ahead Don't worry. you're gonna say you're gonna say <laughs> like it's pretty wild because in the middle of it i'm in this relationship 
And you would think I'd be falling apart in the middle of the relationship, keeping all the balls juggling and everything going. Mm -hmm. But you're so into that trauma bond, or I was, that the drug is working. It's a drug. It's working. You're happy because you're in it, and it's working. And then when they devalue you or you're breaking up with them, like what I was going through, whatever, it was both Mm -hmm. give and take and push and pull and push down, get up. Then it becomes harder because you're bringing your truth out and that and the narcissist doesn't want nothing to do with your truth or the truth at all it's all about their truth and nothing yeah. but their truth so help them god that's it that's it uh, so there was, there was nothing that you could say or do no. that could make him more interested in your heart it no. was almost as if you didn't have a heart no, and it was so heartbreaking. I broke my own heart realizing wow. that in the end. I just broke wow. my own heart and it shattered. And it I have to realize later, it wasn't even him. It was me breaking my own heart. That self-betrayal we've talked about before yeah, with yeah, these yeah. guys and with some other groups. It's like, mm-hmm. and you come out of that drug and you start dripping into the truth over here instead of dripping into their truth. And it's right. like wow no wonder i'm falling on my face because that's what was keeping me going because i was getting that drug and now i'm stepping back and i have unplugged this drug drip right and i'm looking at the truth and you become so weak it's like that drug kept you going and now you fall on your face just so feelings oriented just feel it so intensely that I, i can't get too comfortable and put my guard all the way down because it does hurt sometimes like unless I know I'm in a really safe place and I do have those places thank god and I think it's important for everybody that's another thing I I think I would give a a word of advice just find somebody whether it's a really close friend um just a kindred spirit even if it's through a group even if it's somebody Maybe you've never even met in person. Maybe you don't have anybody in your family or in your circle like that, but you get on one of these narcissistic groups for abuse recovery, or you find some, some kind of group or through a therapy group, something to where you can really open up and like be yourself and just share it. Cause that connection is important. Yeah. And that there vulnerability. Who wrote uh, to me uh, concerning you because they could connect with you. Uh, so you have, a way of describing your heart and what you've gone through that connects with people. And I appreciate you doing this today. I know you're a very busy woman that, uh, you know, I have to weeks in advance have to uh, get you to be a part of this, but I wanted you to be a part of the three days uh, of narcissism and relationships and recovery that we're doing here. Uh, part of the 72 hours of talking about this. Uh, but uh, I got to put up the next posting because I want you to let loose on this posting. You're the one that came up with the posting. It wasn't me. So so I want to put it up there. And then I want you to talk about it. Okay. Are you ready? How you, many times? How many times you do that? One time, but it was okay. like, it was like, you promised me that you were going to do therapy. It was like two months before that for the past two months, there was promises of going to therapy, but it, it's during the holidays. This is happening. There's always an excuse. First of all, there's always a flipping excuse. Don't take any excuses. So don't be understanding. Like, just don't look at their actions and that's it. Not excuses and no understanding language and none of that. Because Not the words. No. Words words going to get you nowhere. No. Like, if you want to be about words, go write a book, be an author, do, you know. <laughs> that's what. <laughs> go write a book. Be about it. That and you be- will, if you go through this, I think we're all going to be sitting down and writing a book if we haven't already. You know how many books there will be written if if everyone starts to do it? Yeah, relatively at the same time, there'll be no end to the amount of books that will be written by people who have been abused by narcissistic, toxic individuals, self-absorbed people. Uh, you, uh, you have not written a book yet, have you? No, First. I have not. I is this a part? Of, is this a part of the crystal teas? Is this the mm-hmm. teas that you're putting out? Is that coming or not? I don't know. <laughs> oh no, it's, this it's is like so much for me. Uh, We're not sure yet. <laughs> the the. You'll have to check it out at the Crystal Tees. The, there you go. Now you're catching. Now you're learning how to plug the stuff. There you go. That was good. You're gonna have to step over to the Crystal Tees to see exactly how that's going to go today. I don't mean. I'm just being screaming at you. All right, listen. Uh, I have enjoyed doing this with you. I know that you gave of your time 
because you have so many things much more important than hanging out with me and doing this. I don't but think you, so. you are a hit. Uh, you are a hit on Narc Abuse TV Instagram, and I'm quite sure people are going to find you uh, at the Crystal Tees to be another hit. Uh, everybody's going to be like, what is this tease thing all about? But that's what we're doing right now. This marketing tease is being brought to you by Narc Abuse TV. All right. So uh, anyhow, I love it when you come on and when we do shows. I really do. And I enjoy conversations with you because you have uh, a lot of great ideas that are going to help a lot of people. And you're just now stepping out of your uncomfortable zone into your comfort zone. I don't know how comfortable <laughs> I ever am, but that's just me. I thrive on being slightly uncomfortable at all times. Right. That that should be a shirt or a book right there. You it thrive keeps, being you know slightly what? uncomfortable. Because it keeps the edge. It keeps your edge on. It's true for career, for personal, whatever. Like when I'm at work, I'm like, I better keep my edge on. So I, you know, keep alert and fresh and edge, huh? okay. All right, here we go. We're going to end the show by doing this. Here it comes. You want your edge. So I'm going to get your edge. Here we go. Okay. Uh, everyone that normally comes on with me, I don't know, 300 some odd guests in the past year, uh, have uh, two seasons done. Um, they trust me. So, so the swivel queen from Twitter here uh, will trust me because I'm going to ask you three questions now that you have no idea that I have set aside for you, just in case we had some more time left. And we do. We've gone 57 minutes and uh, we've given a good idea of what the narc abuse coach had in mind about talking about toxic relationships and discarding. Been able to uh, share that information that you sent over to me. I like that. We're going to do many more shows together. However, Right now, three questions. You ready? Sure. Okay. So when when you woke up today, mm. what was on your mind? Oh God. That is scary stuff. No. Um, probably 